I'd like to uh, briefly introduce our, our first speaker. Uh, Marty Hersey um, is a um, certified uh, speech licensed pathologist, and she is supervisor of the speech language and pathology for the Center of Audiology and Speech Pathology at UTMB. As being a supervisor at, in that department, is also a member of the American Speech Language and Hearing Association and the Texas Speech Language Hearing Association, currently co chairs the uh, TCHA uh, Task Force for Medical Speech Pathology. Um, we always have really good interactive uh, talks with speech pathology, and they have great videos. Uh, something out of, um, I don't know, sci-fi. <laughs> it's great, great work they do. So it's my pleasure to uh, bring to you Marty Hersey. Talking about swallow function in geriatrics, um, The areas that I wanted to discuss today are looking at the phases of normal swallow. I think it's important to know what we actually do when we swallow in order to know what goes wrong with the swallow function. And in addition to that, to look at types and causes of swallowing problems and the signs that we can look for in swallowing problems. In doing that, I also want to touch on how we actually assess, how a speech pathologist assesses pr swallowing problems, and then our procedures to increase the safety of swallow and how we would want caregivers to follow through on that. And then lastly, I, I thought for the geriatric population, it's also important to talk about end of life decision making. Not everybody has a safe functional swallow. And sometimes with geriatrics, the concern is, from the family is not necessarily this, whether they have a safe swallow, but whether or not they want to take away their right to eat and drink by mouth. So that's something I'd like to touch on briefly. The, uh, <laughs> the normal swallow process is really pretty complex, and we don't really think about it because we all just swallow and you're all sitting there eating your lunch and everything's moving along and you don't think about it until something goes wrong. And to me, something goes wrong when you're taking a drink and somebody tells you a joke and you start laughing. And the first thing that happens is that you're coughing cr like crazy because you've just aspirated. And you're like, why did that happen? And that's part of what we're going to talk about today. What happens when the swallow process goes wrong? And we are, for the most part, are pretty normal eaters. and <coughs> We don't, uh, we don't really under, always understand what things happen during swallowing that could make somebody no longer be safe. So the, the other thing about the swallowing process is it's very fast. From the time the food is ready to enter the throat to when it enters the esophagus, about two seconds have passed. There are three phases of swallowing, the oral phase, the pharyngeal phase, and the esophageal phase. And what I'd like to do is, is talk to you about how the swallow takes place. So in the oral phase, the food, we often call, refer to it as the bolus, and the bolus could be a liquid or a solid. It doesn't really matter. But the bolus is placed in the mouth and the lips have to close in order to keep it in there so it doesn't fall out. And then the muscles of the jaw and the tongue, everything takes the bolus and starts moving it around to get it in place. The saliva glands in the mouth are necessary to moisten the food so that it can be properly chewed. And after the food's been chewed, then the tongue takes the bolus and starts to put it in a ball and move it toward the back of the throat. And when it reaches the back of the throat, that's pretty much the end of the oral stage. And then the, the pharyngeal stage takes over. With the pharyngeal stage, that bolus is pushed back down the throat, the, the pharynx. And as that happens, this this is, the, this is a little area below the base of the tongue. It's called the, the epiglottis or the vallecula. And, that, and here's where your vocal cords are. So here's the airway and here's the esophagus. So as the bolus goes down, 
the larynx elevates, this tips forward, tips down, and covers the vocal cords, and that's when you stop breathing. So during the time that the swallow, that the food enters your throat, your larynx lifts, your epiglottis covers it, and the muscles of the throat move it down past this area. And that is when you're holding your breath automatically. So if someone tells you a joke during that point and you stop holding your breath and laugh, then you open up the epiglottis and that drink or food goes right into your airway. So once it gets to the opening, as it's coming down the pharynx, the esophagus is right about here. And as the muscles push it through, then the esophageal stage takes over. And the, the opening of the, the as the esophag no, I'm sorry, as the larynx moves up, that causes the upper esophageal sphincter to open. And that is at the top of the esophagus. The food pushes through the sphincter, the sphincter closes, and then all the muscles of the esophagus continue to push it down into the stomach. So from this point, the back of the tongue, to this point, the top of the esophagus, should take about two seconds. So all the problems that exist in swallowing pretty much exist when this process doesn't happen. So I can pretty much, I'm just going to go past these. You have these in your handout. So thinking back to that picture, if, the, if someone can't close their lips and move their tongue properly, then there's going to be an oral phase problem. They're not going to be able to handle the bolus too well. Patients who've had part of their mandible removed, maybe if they've had cancer, um, burn patients, many of our, or patients even with a stroke might have poor control of their lips. Weak facial muscles. Um, I didn't mean to turn that. Yeah. Weak facial muscles can result in, from a stroke that could affect the food being pocketed in the mouth. I, I uh, saw a patient up on the geriatric unit this morning, and she was on a regular diet. And basically, before I left, I took all the food out of her mouth that was sitting in there. And she was not chewing or swallowing any of it. So her weakness was not allowing her to chew the food, but she was drinking just fine. Reduced sensation in the mouth can cause poor awareness of where the bolus was located. She had significantly reduced sensation. She had no idea that there was anything in her mouth. I asked her if she swallowed, and she said yes. So that's not uncommon for stroke patients. It's very common for patients with dementia to have reduced sensation. They may not specifically have a swallowing problem in their throat, but they have a problem recognizing there's something in their mouth, and that can make them at risk for aspiration. Uh, difficulty triggering the swallow reflex so that the muscles move too slowly. Patients that are deconditioned, patients who have had a stroke, um, any other type of brain problems, they may have trouble getting started, getting that swallow initiated. I'm just curious, do some people have, let's say, like you mentioned, this lady, she couldn't feel the bolus in her mouth, but she could swallow liquids. I've seen patients that have trouble with the liquids mm -hmm. as opposed to the solid. Right. What are you going to explain? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to get Sorry. into that. No, that's okay. That's okay. Because there, there are different reasons why different things work for okay. different people. But that's, that's a really good question. And if I don't get to it, make sure I, you get back okay. to me on that. So along with what I was just saying, the difficulty coordinating the muscles can cause, um, if, they're not, if everything's not working in sync and everything doesn't happen at the same time, then the airway isn't protected. Just as if there's a, a slow processing of all those movements, then perhaps if the food starts coming down the throat too quickly, then the airway isn't protected. So as the question previously, with thin liquids, if someone is slow in initiating, triggering that swallow, and you give them a thin liquid, there's a likelihood that it will start down the throat before they've actually started the swallow. So that means the larynx didn't elevate, the epiglottis didn't invert, 
and nothing's protecting the airway and liquid is going down. They haven't swallowed yet. So there's nothing protecting anything and then there's a likelihood of it going in the airway. However, if what you're giving them is thicker and it's slower to move down, then you're using gravity. You're using slowing the, gra you know, the gravitational move of the, of the bolus to allow more time to initiate the swallow. So the idea of thicker liquids is really gravity. It's just slowing down the action. Um, so if they don't elevate the larynx, they're not going to get the opening of the esophagus. So it's all, it's all interconnected. Um, some of our older folks have what I call pressed B larynx or pressed B pharynx. They have old throat. And maybe they don't have anything really wrong. I have presbyphrenia, and that's old brain. So, <laughs> but old throat to me is they're, they're not necessarily a stroke patient or anything really particular, but the muscles just don't work that well. So the squeezing action of the food as it's, as it's going into the throat, it's not pushing down as well. So they, they're chewing it and they're swallowing it, but it's not all going down. So compensatory strategies, maybe they need a drink to clear it. And one of the films I'm going to show you is a really good example of someone who has really weak, I call that peristalsis, the squeezing action of moving the food down into the food tube. And then sometimes the food gets into the esophagus and it doesn't go anywhere because their esophagus is not mobile. We don't really work with that aspect. To me, then you're really getting into a GI problem if they have esophageal dysmotility. The diseases that can cause swallowing problems, stroke, brain injury, Parkinson's disease, MS, ALS, Alzheimer's. I don't usually think of them as having a pharyngeal dysphagia where they are aspirating because they have poor muscle control. I see them with a memory problem, that it's an oral stage. They forget what's in their mouth. And they're the patients who often do better on a liquid diet because they have, an, they have a good swallow, but they forget to use it. So if you put food in their mouth, it might just sit there. And then you lay them back down, and if nobody's checked, then it starts falling back while they're laying down. But a nice cold liquid can trigger that sensation of swallow. I mean, just think in yourself that if you have a bite of food in your mouth, how long you could hold it without swallowing, but what if you took a big slug of a cold liquid? It would, you would feel that need to swallow it. If it's room temperature liquid, not as much. So temperature can make a difference also. Yes? Now for somebody with fairly advanced Alzheimer's who does forget to swallow their solid food, would the cold liquid help them to be able to also deal with the, the food or do you have to strip of the cold liquid for them and do some other kind of feeding? If, um, if they can alternate consistencies, like if they take a bite of something and they're actually, they've actually manipulated it somewhere and then you take a liquid to wash it down, but if they're pretty advanced and they're not doing anything with the bolus in their mouth, then it would probably be a lot of work and time with little nutritional value. And I, I kind of look at what's the most bang for your buck? Where can you get that person? How can you get nutrition with minimum aspiration risks? And if they're not really requesting food and you're kind of putting it on them, then you may do better with more liquids and, and less solids. So signs of swallowing problems. Um, I want to make sure that, that you all know what I think of as aspiration. And to me, if liquids or food penetrate into the laryngeal port, past the vocal cords, down into the trachea, and that, that once they're past the vocal cords, that's aspiration. Now, a patient can aspirate and clear it, but once it's gone through the vocal cords, I consider that aspiration. And some of our individuals really clearly give you signs that they've aspirated. Um, they cough when they're eating or drinking or soon after eating or drinking. You hear wet, gurgly sounds when you give them something, or it takes multiple, multiple swallows of them for them to get down what they're trying to take. And so those are the pretty easy ones to look at. Another thing might be that if the patient is on a monitor, if they're on a pulse ox monitor, and you see a change in their oxygen saturation, that would be an, uh, an indication of aspiration. Or if there's a temperature change, 
in 30 to 60 minutes after meals. A patient with weight loss, that could be an, a sign of aspiration if the patient is no longer eating and, of course, repetitive pneumonias. The problem is that 40% of dysphagic patients don't have any outward signs or symptoms of aspiration. So when I go to the floor and I ask the nurse what's going on with the patient and they say they take their meds fine, there's no cough, everything's going fine. So they may, I mean, that is, that's their clinical assessment because there are no signs. So looking for cues for silent aspiration are a little bit harder. And one thing I always look for is significant delay in swallow reflex. My, this woman this morning was borderline. It took her at least five seconds for every swallow of liquid that she took. And when I put a food in her mouth, forget it, it just wasn't going anywhere. So that told me that she had a certain amount of risk factor going on. Um, if, you, if you see that as they swallow, the larynx, the Adam's apple, just moves a little bit. If it doesn't move about an inch, that could be an indication that they're an aspiration risk. Because remember, we were talking earlier about how it has to move up in order for the epiglottis to flip down. So if it's not moving much, it's not protecting the airway either. Sometimes, they, well after they've finished eating and drinking, they'll start coughing later. And that could be a sign that, that they're aspirating. Unfortunately, with the older folks, they are, the more their sensitivity reduces, the more likely that, that they have silent aspiration because they're just not that sensitive. The woman I saw this morning, I basically stuck my hand down her throat because I, I didn't, sorry, didn't have a tongue depressor on me and I had my gloved finger and I was looking just to see what was happening with the back of her throat and she had dentures in, and I was pressing on her soft palate, and nothing was happening. She wasn't gagging. She wasn't carrying on. I would not expect her to be um, a coughing aspirator. She did cough on me once, but she's not going to have a lot of, give you a lot of signs and symptoms because she's, she has such poor oral awareness. So the... Um, the reason all this is important is that to me the, the nurses, the healthcare professionals or providers that are with individuals or their caregivers are at home, they're the ones that are most likely to see the, uh, these patients on a consistent basis. The doctors don't see them. They come in and they want to know what everybody else thinks, but they're not the ones that are seeing them with their meals or seeing them with their medications. And this is the time to monitor for signs and symptoms of aspiration with meals, with medications, and to make sure there aren't any significant signs. Um, did something? So there are three things that we do that we could do when we're looking at swallow function. And one thing is the bedside swallow exam. And that's usually the first step. So if the patient's in the hospital, we would go to see them at bedside and we would look at them to see not only are they safe to eat and drink, um, are there signs and symptoms of aspiration, but also is their present diet appropriate? So looking at the medical history, the swallowing history, doing an oral motor examination to see how strong the muscles of their mouth are, if there's any reduced coordination, then we would give them something to eat it could be um, water, juice, a thick liquid, pudding, a chewable, and then watch them while they're swallowing. Check for laryngeal elevation. I usually like to use a, a stethoscope at the throat. It's called cervical auscultation, and I listen there for their swallowing. I listen there for their voicing because I can hear it more clearly. And it still isn't, it's not foolproof, Lots of aspiration, especially silent aspiration, gets by us with a bedside eval, but it's usually our first assessment. With the woman this morning, she, um, her structures were weak, her muscles were weak. So it wasn't that I thought she was a big aspiration risk, but I thought her diet was inappropriate. And I didn't think she was going to get adequate nutrition with the diet she had. With the modified barium swallow, that is um, 
completed in radiology with the speech pathologist and the radiologist using video imaging. And if the patient appears to be unsafe at bedside and we're not clear about a diet, then we might suggest that they have this procedure. They're placed in, we have this wonderful chair we put them in, and they're placed upright and put in something that looks like a sardine can. They're squished in. It's a very tight space and, and not a very comfortable procedure. It's somewhat confusing for the patient to put them through a modified barium swallow. We also then have to give them the same food consistencies we do at the bedside, but everything has to have barium in it. Otherwise, we can't observe them by video. The barium is, of course, the contrast that we can then see them. And we're able to, we see their mouth and their throat, and we view them we view them from the side, and then we can look at any swallowing abnormalities which might affect the safety or the efficiency of their swallow. And then if something's going on right at that time during the swallow study, we try compensatory strategies. So if we give them a liquid and they're aspirating, we might try a chin tuck, a head turn. We do something at that time to see if we can, if we can provide a safe swallow anything we can to find some consistency that they would be safe on. We would not finish the evaluation until we do. And if we are unable to find a safe food or drink, then at that point we would discontinue the study. So I wanted to show you um, a little clipping of a modified barium swallow. The swallow. You can see the food, in this case liquid, is quickly taken into the oral cavity and swallowed. So you can the see how fast they go down. The whole swallowing process should take about one second yeah. from the time the food enters the back of the throat until it enters the stomach. In this image, the patient swallows a pureed food, which is thicker in consistency than liquid and, there's that, and tends to there's hold that its shape while being that swallowed. Has to invert. You, s you can see it kind of popping down there. And here, we see an example of a patient with a normal swallow eating solid food. The food is a cookie with barium on it. So the thicker the This next image the shows a patient with down. a delayed pharyngeal response. Unlike that of a normal swallow where the pharyngeal response is triggered when the food reaches the back of your mouth, the pharyngeal swallow does not occur until the food enters and overfills an area of your throat called the volliculi. So the swallow should be here. triggered here and that swallow wasn't triggered. Here is triggered another before. image of a patient with a down. delayed pharyngeal response. But although the patient has swallowed the food bolus, the peristalsis, or squeezing action necessary to move the food towards the stomach is incomplete, leaving a lot of food throughout the throat area. This image also shows a patient with a delayed pharyngeal response. In addition to the food entering and overfilling the volliculi prior to the swallow, as indicated earlier, the food traces around the top of the trachea and fills an area called the piriform sinus, before the pharyngeal response occurs. Here is an example of a patient's food entering the passageway, leading to the lungs, which could cause pneumonia. There are so numerous techniques used course. to help patients swallow safely. For example, this next patient swallows a liquid in addition to multiple swallows to help clear the throat area of remaining food. Another compensatory technique used to control aspiration is consistency of food. In this image, we see a patient who is aspirating thin liquids similar to coffee. But when given thicker foods with more body, he swallows it effectively without you can any see aspiration. That it's really gravity. It's just, it's in to prevent food things. from sticking to the, the throat as seen here, better. this patient will now take two swallows before taking another bite. The second swallow helps clear the throat area of any food. Here we see a patient with food sticking only on one side of the throat, their affected or weak side of the body. To compensate, we turn the head to help close off this area to facilitate a complete swallow. To help the patient with an easier, safer swallow, we recommend different consistencies of food. Here is an example of a patient who can safely swallow food with a consistency similar to ground hamburger. However, he has significant difficulties swallowing food that is larger. Now, he attempts to swallow a small piece of cookie whole. As you can see, 
it sits in the throat area, which could lead to an obstruction of the airway if left unassisted. And so that would be a concern for an Alzheimer patient, too. That's the end of that one. Thanks. Um, another assessment tool that we've been using in the last year is called fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing, or FEES. And with this, we take a small endoscope. I love the write-up that they wanted, you know, they tell you it's about the size of a shoelace. And, and I'll, I'll see if any of the patients I've used it on will say that's true. They probably won't. A big shoelace. And, you, and it's passed through the nasal passage into the throat. And then there's a camera on the tip of the scope. And then that sends the image to a, a screen. So we can actually watch it on a screen. Now, usually when the ear, nose, and throat doctors go in, they're just doing it with the naked eye. And we, we're actually putting it on a screen so we can visualize it better. And then while the, then we go ahead and feed the patient. They can talk and eat and do all the same things they do during a modified barium swallow. But the difference is we're actually looking at their, or, at their structures. We can't see the oral structures because we're sitting down below their tongue, but we can see their vocal cords, we can see the epiglottis, we can see the piriforms, and we can see the opening into the esophagus. And so we can do the same strategies. If we see them get into trouble, we can try different strategies. And one of the biggest advantage for us is we can do it at bedside. So if a patient's on lots of tubes, if they're old, if it's hard to get them up in, in the kind of positioning we need for a modified, if they're demented, we can take the equipment to the bedside and do it there. And it's a lot faster, a lot um, easier often for the patient in spite of the uh, tube. So I have a, a tape of that that I'm going to show you. Um, I have to apologize for uh, the hyperverbal speech pathologist because part of, there's two of us doing each one of these and we're basically talking about it the whole time. So it's pretty uh, chatty. Okay. They're clearing to the cord. So you can the see cord. that. Um, OK, relax. I want this you to swallow glottis. for me, OK? Just breathe. Don't swallow. This is Don't a Parkinson swallow. patient. Just and that's milk. And there's his, 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 his uh, he cleared his throat. But Esophagus is right there. Can you clear your throat for me? Yeah. And then yeah. when he did that, can you call? Th there's his airway, there's his vocal cords, and you can see milk coming out when she told him to cough. Right. There's milk it. sitting there, pooled in the. Can you swallow that? In that little molecular yeah. area. I can't. About oh, residue in the piriform and molecular. Okay, relax. Okay, I just. Now, again, it's up a glass of the way. You can yeah. have him say ee. Say ee. So she's gone from nectar thick okay. to honey thick. Relax, don't Because he's still aspirated okay. with nectar. I'm, I'm going to. Honey thick liquid. Lots of secretions. This isn't. And you see all the tremorous so movements of him. This is, a, as I said, a Parkinson patient. And that's another problem is that they're unable to, his, he's unable to move his epiglottis too much, and his cords are constantly opening and closing, which don't give him good protection. Every time the screen turns white, that's a swallow. We get a white out during the swallow because as they swallow, they block the camera. So that's when we know the moment of swallow occurs. So if we see the blue start to come down before the whiteout, we know that, that they're very delayed with their swallow. Now you can see right at Just the front of his vocal me. cords, he's Just got blue sitting swallow, in okay. there. Okay. The e and there's, he's saying, and that it's, it's all just coated right on top of his cords. Here we go. Mm -hmm. You don't need to do it. Okay. I'm not sure what that. Oh, this is cracker. Molecular residue. I think he's trying to no, eat a cracker. Thick liquid. We try to keep it colorful. Yeah. The so, to the molecular, but triggers so with this, she's giving him a, a really thick liquid to try to clear the cracker, and actually, he was successful. This is a more normal patient. I would just. Yeah, whenever you're ready. 
It's just really a big picture here, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. I would. A little bit of you can see the that lecula. that he looks. His movement looks a little bit better. Yeah, yeah, He's, I would call him a geriatric okay, patient, coughing, but and this no is a good example of somebody so drink, who hasn't changed his style. He came yep. in because food sticks in his throat. His vocal cords are thin, and I call that old milk. cords, and that's some, typical with older people that the, they thin out. The UES. And because of that, he, he doesn't have the same optimal swallow as he did prior to the UES. when he was a little younger. Okay. So Go he's ahead. handling okay. liquids fine. He's That's a big piece of cracker so sitting need? there. You need a drink. And he's, he's, he's just drink. wanting to swallow. I know, but you need a drink. Because it's just sticking all over. Yeah. Significant residue. Keep swallowing until you feel like it's all cleared. <coughs> you feel like it all cleared? Mm -hmm. Okay. And that was, th I think that's the end of it. That was basically what he needed. His throat had changed. It wasn't working as well as it was before, but he was certainly, thank you, he was certainly safe. But he hadn't learned a strategy. And all he had to do was alternate consistencies. And as long as he took a drink, he could get his food down. But honestly, it was just never going to work like it used to. And that's part of strategies that happen as we age, that our throat changes, and for some people, they're going to be permanent changes. So what can we do to increase safety of swallow? Part of it is food selection, liquid consistency. We were talking earlier about what they should have. Um, thin liquids require a precise tongue control to collect and hold the liquids against the roof of the mouth until the swallow is triggered. So if someone has a very delayed swallow reflex, they'll be more at risk for aspiration with a thin liquid. And with a thicker liquid, just that cohesiveness of the bolus makes it slower in going down the throat and they may protect their airway. So that's a way to protect people. Food consistencies, pureed a regular, obviously puree is the easiest to swallow and for some folks they may need that or they may need it more chopped. Setting, the postural changes, increased awareness, um, taking small sips and bites, alternating sips and bites. Some patients, if you give them a straw, they will aspirate. If, they do, if they're drinking by cup, they won't. So figuring out what is the best strategy to use, um, giving them more time between swallows, telling them to swallow twice with every amount, sensory cues, hot versus cold, Room temperature is harder for older people. They don't feel it as much. But a cold bolus in the mouth will, will trigger a swallow much faster than room temperature. The environment. With a head injured patient, if they've got the TV going and all, all kinds of things going on, they may be very impulsive eaters. They may eat way too fast. And a lot of folks need to have a quiet environment. For many people, their medications need to be given in something thick. Or in, or in a puree. And then after they eat, some people will always have to be checked for pocketing food. Increasing safety of swallow, there are some therapeutic techniques that help people. We use various forms of thermal stimulation, and they would, could include using instrument, cold instrumentation or frozen lemon glycerin swabs and stroking specific areas in the back of the throat to increase muscle strength and speed of swallow reflex. There are also uh, other techniques that are being used in the community. One is a, a, an electric stimulation to the neck. We don't currently do that here, but we know places that do, and we can refer people to those places. Sometimes exercises help. If they have a weak lips or tongue or palate or facial muscles, they might benefit from some exercises. So when we place a precaution in somebody's room and we tell what kinds of things they should or shouldn't have, it's usually based on our evaluation. So we understand why someone shouldn't have a straw because they might aspirate, or they need to swallow twice, or they need to, sep they need to take a, a bite and then a sip. So that usually is decided based on what we're clinically seeing or what we see through our assessment. So if, some, if a patient is in the hospital here, and we're following them, we would have a sign in their room. 
One of the other issues is thickening liquids. That is um, a concern to me because most people don't seem to know how to do it. And everyone's in a hurry. The food comes and you want to, if someone's in the hospital, the nurses are busy, they've got lots of patients to take care of, so they quickly take the cup, they dump some of the thickener in and they stir it up and it's not thick enough, so they put some more in and stir it up and it's still not quite right and they put a little bit more and it looks just right and then they go and get the tray ready. By the time they hand it to the patient, it's pudding. So the cans tell you that it takes, depending on the product, it takes 30 seconds to two minutes to get to the consistency that it's supposed to be. I say two minutes. So my recommendation is you come in, you take the cup, and all of the directions are for four ounces. So if you have eight ounces, you're just going to double it. So you take the cup, you put in the amount. If you're giving them Insure, Insure is not a thick liquid. It's just like milk. So if they need a nectar consistency, you're going to put in one and one-half tablespoons. You mix it up and you just let it sit. You'll look at it and say, well, it doesn't look like anything, and it won't for about two minutes. So once that gets worked out for a patient, then it, it's much better. I find that the patients won't drink if it's too thick, which is understandable. So it's important to get the, to get the liquids to the consistency that was recommended and not any greater, because the other issue is dehydration for these folks, especially the older ones. And because of that, in recent years, we've come up with, with other recommendations, and that is something we call free water protocol. So if a patient is at risk for aspiration with thin liquids, then definitely we don't want them eating and drinking and putting um, bacteria into their airway. But we are also concerned about their hydration and their quality of life. So we do have conditions where we will give people ice or water who are not on thin liquids. Um, the research, I have research on this that I've studied, and basically the concept is that they, yes, they will aspirate the water most likely, but water is a pretty benign substance. And unless they're drinking huge amounts of it, there'll be small amounts of water going into the lungs. It will probably evaporate into the system, and our body has, is composed of water anyway. So the important fact factor is that they have to have very good oral hygiene because you don't want to be washing a lot of bacteria into their lungs. But if they're aspirating on water, they're aspirating on their own secretions. So we feel that with good oral care and that patients can be hydrated with water carefully. If the patient is coughing and choking a lot, when you try it, they're not a good candidate because making them uncomfortable is not the goal. So if the patient is not able to take anything by mouth, if they are NPO, then we would assess them with ice chips and water and see if they can comfortably take sips of it without being distressed. And if they can, and if their medical status is stable enough, we would ask the physician for an order. This has, to, if they're in the hospital, this has to be physician approved. If they're at home, then it's up to the caregiver to decide how they would want to work with this. In the hospital, we post a sign over the bed if the patient has been cleared for water by mouth. If the patient is on a diet, but they have to have their liquids thickened, then they may not have water during meals or for 30 minutes after meals. Because our goal is to make sure there's nothing there that the water is going to wash into their airway. And they also cannot be given medication with water. So the water is strictly for hydration and to be given when there's nothing else in the throat so that there's the, the minimal risk is that the aspiration that occurs would only be with water. And that, again, is with the approval of the physician. And that's a, just an example of something we might place at the bedside, that someone's on a free water protocol. And then the last area is uh, end of life. Our our organization feels that we contribute to the overall quality of life of patients nearing end of life and that our goal of intervention may not be rehabilitative but facilitative. And the issues that, that we have are, you know, looking at these areas are just the general, you know, the, 
the fact of where is the patient. If it's a geriatric patient and they come in to the hospital and there are end of life issues and there are aspiration concerns, then our first concern is where's the family and what is their desire. I feel professionally that I have to tell every patient and family member what aspiration risks are present, but it is also, we also have to listen to what the family and the patient want based on all of the factors that might be involved. Um, there have been, one study I looked at said that over half of patients who die, or at least in this particular study that they looked at, had end-of-life decisions that they made as far as withdrawing or withholding medical care or some form of treatment. And the inability for someone to feed orally is part of the disease process. So when we're talking about someone who is at end of life and who is having trouble, trouble eating, their problem eating is part of their, of their disease. So giving them enteral care, giving them a feeding tube of some type does not change their disease factor. And actually, as far as limitations of tube feeds, there's really no evidence that shows that patients with feeding tubes don't aspirate or that they survive longer. One of the things that happens to patients as their systems start to deteriorate is they do not process nutrition as well. So if a patient is still taking small sips and bites, then they decide how much they're going to take. But when we tube feed patients, we decide how much they take. And in some cases, we may overfeed them. And they may actually have more problems with processing the food, more problems with reflux, more problems with aspiration. Um, dehydration, you know, the, most of these patients, they're really, they're dying of dehydration, not of starvation. And that is a different process when they no longer can swallow and eat by mouth. And part of, we see part of our goal is to communicate with the patients, the family, the physicians, and to determine what everybody wants for that patient. If we assess their swallowing, we will do our best to tell them what is safest. We may be able to tell them that if they take thick liquids only, they will aspirate less, but they will still aspirate. And that if they do thin liquids, that will be the most aspiration. And chewables might also be the most. So we may be able to tell them consistencies that would be the safest without being able to guarantee um, that they will not <coughs> aspirate. And we see part of our role is to allow families and patients to make decisions about what they want for themselves, educated decisions. And that, um, and that is, an, especially with our geriatric population, this has come up more and more for us where we're asked to evaluate swallowing in patients who are near end of life. And then this is just uh, how you can reach us if you have a referral or request. And then obviously we're a department of people who have no trouble talking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One question? Yes. Uh, to go back sure. a little bit. I, I, I guess it's the, it's the only one I, it says, signs of swallowing problems. The temperature spikes 30 to 60 minutes after meals, and then it goes back to normal? And why is that? What, what, what is the physiological process for this? A spike? Well, I think the spike occurs because if they've aspirated, they can have a, they can have a temperature spike, just like a desaturation. During aspiration, it could actually cause a patient's oxygen um, saturation to go down temporarily, and then it goes right back up again. So the spiking in temperature could be that it causes, the, you know, the aspiration can cause a, a fluctuation in their, in their whatever process is part of their temperature, you know, so that they would actually fever briefly, brief fever, and then it would go back down immediately because they're not in, a, they're not in pneumonia yet. They're, they've just had an aspiration. It's just, a, it's just a spike. 
It's not always, I mean, again, it's not always easy to catch that. We actually catch it more in the babies because they're monitored so closely. So we catch the, the oxygen, oxygen in our, when we're feeding babies by bottle who we think have aspiration risks, when they desat, they can desat big time and then they'll just come right back up again within about a minute. And then as far as, as the spiking of temperature, the, in our, in our you know, step down intensive care, the nurses are taking temperatures more often and we usually get more feedback. I think it's harder to, to catch that on, on older patients. Any comments?